This is the Apocalypse Survival Guide. We are here to help you survive the apocalypse. Which apocalypse, you ask? All of them, from A to Z. Each week we cover a different type of apocalypse and give you advice on how to survive. The rules are simple. We choose an apocalypse depicted in a movie and cover how you could survive that type of apocalypse. So stock up on supplies and get ready to survive. Hi, I'm Drew. I'm Frank. And welcome to the bunker. On our episode today, uh, we're on to the letter C. And for this week, we're going to talk C as in climate change. And the example, the movie example we chose was The Day After Tomorrow. Uh, it's a movie that addresses abrupt climate changes and how it turns it into a modern day apocalypse. Um, I guess we'll start off by talking about uh, this disaster, the, uh, the strength, so to speak. Um, obviously this was an abrupt climate shift, something that didn't occur over, you know, generations, 20, 30, 40, 50, hundred years. It occurred over, I believe a span of weeks, five minutes, five minutes, you know, 20 minutes in screen time. Well, if you ask the scientists on the matter, it has been happening over a matter of, uh, hundreds of years, but for it to culminate all at once like that was interesting. It is interesting. Um, uh, somewhat, I don't want to say unbelievable, but I will say that you never know. You never know. I mean, you know, things happen out there in the world, uh, you know, something something outside our control, meaning man's control, could possibly, you know, with the sun, cause this type of thing. I mean, the catalyst, we could argue, but I guess we'll say that we'll assume that there is a catalyst out there that could cause this, and, you know, this is what you would do to survive if it happened. And possibly it could happen like the movie said, even though I don't believe so. But at least it gives you an idea of what to do if this were to occur. And, you know, if it happens in 100 years and you start preparing now, you'll really be prepared. <laughs> so uh, one of the, I guess, the initially the strengths, um, I remember in Tokyo there was fist-sized chunks of ice. Yeah. That's not good. Um, you Definitely don't even that for Tokyo because they're already small. Yes, they're already small and uh, compact, and a lot of people are going to get hit. Yeah, that'd be like us getting hit with uh, bowling balls. Yes, yes. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, anyway. yeah, That's true. They are small people, too. They're small so people. <laughs> that that's that's even what I bigger. meant. They're small people. <laughs> uh, there was hurricanes, uh, tsunamis, cyclones. There was tornadoes in L.A., which is not a tornado area. No, unprecedented. Um. So, I mean, but I will say the, um, not positive, but when it was abrupt, but it wasn't abrupt in this case, as in you go to bed and you wake up the next day and your house is covered by, uh, you know, 10 feet of snow or um, that there's all of a sudden, I mean, it, there were some warning signs if you're paying attention that the climate is shifting. Yeah, I mean... I don't think you could go to bed and wake up, but as far as the time that it happened, what was the time frame? It was. I think initially they days. said, uh, well, I think when uh, Dennis Quaid, who was the lead in this movie, initially put his model in 16 months, and then they said, no, you're reading it wrong, 16 weeks. Oh. So this occurred over 16 weeks. Um, but, I mean, air travel was deemed unsafe and they couldn't fly because the winds were so strong. Planes were crashing and getting destroyed. Um, roads were flooding because of all the torrential rain. Trains were getting flooded out because the tracks were getting flooded from out underneath and the trains couldn't run. Especially the subways. And so, yeah, subways is bad because obviously below ground. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you're cutting off your routes of travel, your, your major ways of moving. And then if everyone sees this and everyone tries to get out of town and anyone who's lived in a big city and wants to go to work or leave work at the same time as everybody else, that nine to fiver, you know how bad traffic can be then. Now you add on the fact that everyone thinks that the world's ending, which, you know, world as we know it was ending. And how's that going to be for people trying to get out of town? Yeah, can you imagine New York City with no public transportation? That's, yeah. That's that's an impossibility. That can't happen. I New mean, York, uh, Chicago, 
Um, I'm trying to think. L.A. I don't know how I've ever been to L.A. I don't know how it is for public transportation. But any of these major cities that rely on public transportation, and then you cut that off. Yeah. I mean, obviously not a good day. Yeah, you're stationary. Although you're stationary. you probably need to be stationary in this situation. Well, I mean, you do, but it depends on where you're stationary. Obviously, we'll get into that. I think in shelter, depending on what part of the country you're in. I mean, you and you, we can argue, you know, either way. Right. Um, you know, obviously, uh, there was a lot of rain, which resulted in flooding, which caused the oceans to rise initially, which caused streets to flood. Um, it shows it rising to the point where the lower levels of buildings were flooding. Um, like when they're, in, uh, I guess we'll go to uh, the Prince of Persia himself, Jake Gyllenhaal, who uh, <laughs> who was his Dennis Quaid's son, and uh, he was trapped in the library, the New York Public Library, I guess was yeah. what it was. And they had to, they ran in, and the floods were coming, and then uh, they had to go to the higher floors because the water was so high up. Now. <clears throat> I'm not a scientist, but you something did stay just at a occurred. Holiday Inn Express. Yeah, right, exactly. But something just occurred to me about the torrential rains and then the oceans rising. The ocean should not rise because of torrential rains. From what I know, the water that we have, liquid water on the planet, is the water that we have. If it's raining, it came from the ocean. It's just raining and going back into the ocean. It shouldn't rise the level of the ocean because it's all we have the same amount of water in our atmosphere in our on our planet. It just cycles. It's just in a big cycle. Hmm. The only way that we're going to add more water to the level of our oceans is from melting the ice caps, which they do touch on. But which allegedly the ice cap <clears throat> is melting and falling into the sea. Right. So do you think that would be th- the cause of the rising ocean again? I'm no expert on it. That's just what I have come to believe over and I guess over time is that the water we have is the water we have unless it melts off from somewhere. I wonder how much ice uh, and you know I'm not going to look into it cuz but how much ice do we have <laughs> in the polar caps that if it all suddenly became liquid? Oh, that would be a big problem. Yeah. Huge problem. Yeah. yeah well, like, I think that's what kind of they were leading towards was if I remember correctly uh, is Dennis Quaid was giving a speech and his, you know, whatever. Anyway, so then the big piece of the polar ice cap, north, south, whatever, broke off, went into the ocean. Yeah, the side of Rhode Island. The size of Rhode Island, which isn't that big if you really look it up. But anyway, um, compared to the other states, it's just an itty bitty state. It's tiny, but it'd still be a huge. It would be a huge ice. chunk of ice. I don't want to run into it. Right. But uh, and so the you know the flood water. So we'll assume that there's enough global warming. Causing global freezing, anyway, that would break off the ice cap. That enough chunks or si- or enough or one huge chunk went to the ocean, melted, rose the the ocean level, then became rain, which then flooded everything. Yeah, I think we need to touch on the global warming leading to global freezing. That it, it, again, not a scientist. I mean, that that might be perfectly. Sound science, but I, I I couldn't tell you one way or the other. But what was the explanation again? The explanation was according to the movie, and I've kind of I did do a little research, and they they indicated that the science of the movie was shitty, but the okay <laughs> the principle behind it was good. They're claiming, and we're not going to get into whether you believe in climate change, global warming, all that stuff. Um, but the idea is that there's a a current in the ocean of salted water and fresh water and warm water comes north towards between America and one of those other continents and uh, probably Europe and uh, curves around and then comes south again. And there was an over, there was a, there was a lack of salination that the melting of the ice caps caused by global warming was causing this fresh water to come into the ocean and then melt and throw off the balance of the salted water and the fresh water, which was causing the cold water, the current to change and move farther south, which was allowing the storms to move south. The the frozen, I don't know. Again, not a scientist. So The science seems kind of iffy. Yeah, so basically the changing of salinated water and the, the balance of that allowed for the pole to come more south 
and then bring the storms with us. Are you telling me that there's these mega fucking ice hurricanes in the North Pole? Because I've never heard of that. I've never heard of them. But they're going to, I think they're claiming that because of whatever. I will say this. 10,000 years ago, there was was an ice age. There was a, a legit ice age. And people were not around in the form that they are now with cars and buildings and, and, and energy plants, coal, whatever, causing fossil fuels that allegedly are causing greenhouse gases. Sure. And, and we still had an ice age. So was it, what caused that? Was it woolly mammoth farts? Was it dinosaur <laughs> fart? I'm being serious. What are they claiming for that? What, what caused that? And I'm not saying that it can't. If it happened 10,000 years ago, obviously it can happen it can again. Happen now. Right. And that's why we need to cover it. But whether you, it, I'm not gonna. We're not intelligent enough, obviously, because you've, if you've listened to the first two podcasts, no, we're not intelligent we at all. Are not claiming to be a brain trust. But just, I'm not. You know, is are we causing it? Maybe we are. Maybe we're not. I don't know. I don't but know. the point is, is that I don't think that whatever we do in the next twenty years is going to cause this. But whatever caused the first ice age, maybe that is something that. We have no control over either way. I think, and you may be facing something like this. Yeah, I think it probably is more something to do with that. Just the cyclical nature of the planet, and it's going to have an ice age every so many, so many tens years. of thousands of years. Well, I'll throw oh, this out for an ice age. I'll throw this out there, and it's technically not under this category. We might cover it again, <clears throat> but if an asteroid were to strike and cause enough debris in the air to block out the sun, it would become very cold. Mm. And maybe possibly resemble this, but C is for climate change. So we'll assume that there is things going on, and and there are things that are going on as far as the climate change. And it may not mean that we're doing it, but that the climate's always changing, and it could be like you just said, cyclical. And we're eventually going to come back around to this. And it's just in the next couple of decades. Who knows? And it it could oh. get colder, and we could have this. But anyway, I, hope not. I don't even like winter. I don't either. I surely don't want it to be constant. No, no. A nice fall, you know, where during the day I can wear pants and a t-shirt and then maybe a like jacket at night. That's my ideal weather. Yeah. Also, I like long walks on the beach. <laughs> if anyone's interested. If anyone's interested, uh, this is Drew. I, I yeah. am lonely. Leave oh, a, anyway. Leave a comment on the podcast. Yeah, yeah leave a comment. Um, so, I mean, the climate is obviously all screwed up. Uh, We've got massive first rain, hurricane, tsunamis, tornadoes, which then turns into these three winter superstorms over like Canada, Europe, Asia, everywhere. And then they're slowly working their way down. Um, And apparently these superstorms were bringing cold... Air that was negative 150 degrees is what they stated in the movie. Now, again, not here to debunk the science, but I looked it up on the line, and if it's on the internet, it must be true. But apparently, the coldest that it was ever recorded on planet Earth, and this was one of the Arctic's north or south, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not that smart. It was negative 135.8 degrees. So it's tech, it is technically possible to get close to 150 degrees. Negative 150 degrees Fahrenheit. We're talking yeah. Fahrenheit here, because uh, I don't believe in that Celsius. Because um, I'm, I'm crazy. From, I'm from America. That's crazy science. We got Fahrenheit over here. Um, Back to the damn Brits. Yeah, and at one point, speaking of the Brits, they did show a helicopter. The fuel lines froze, and they crashed because it was so cold. It was, it was in the middle of this negative 150 degree superstorm that they got caught in. And I looked it up. According to the web on the line at negative fifty two point six degrees Fahrenheit, jet fuel will freeze. No. Oh. Now that's talking in a now there was some debate about pressurized lines. A lot of modern aircraft have aircraft have heated fuel lines to prevent freezing, obviously, because yeah, you don't want freezing as you're flying. So but I mean hundred let's just say the coldest ever record was negative one hundred thirty five point eight. That would be Possibly with heated fuel lines and pressurized fuel lines, it would cause some issues with helicopters sure. or aircraft of any kind. But I mean, that's getting kind of sciencey. I did a little bit of research. Sciencey. Um, 
some of the other things you have to you know think about are obviously there was a loss of utilities at one point once the floodwaters came in you lost electric you lost um obviously heat communication yeah. um cell phones went down uh they showed pay phones still working at some point but that was the movie was made in the early 2000s 2017 are there any pay phones at anywhere have you seen one lately and and grand we I, mean, do- I don't look but god i can't recall seeing a pay phone for some time yeah i mean there may be some somewhere and maybe in a big city or some place where someone lives they may say yeah we still got a couple pay phones here at a bus stop i don't know oh, okay. train, I station, train station maybe station. maybe Airport, possibly a couple here and there, but every I mean, that's almost everyone has a cell phone. I know where there'd be a payphone in a jail. Oh, and they that's, you know what? Jails, but they're not really pay phones necessarily. That's true. It's, I mean, somebody's paying on the other end. There are there are to be, yeah. pay phones, quote unquote, <laughs> in jails. I didn't think about that. There you go. We're not going to ask why so you know if, that. If you're in this apocalypse and you, you go to jail, cell phones are down break into a jail and you can use the phone you'd be the first one in history yes to break into a jail you probably would and you're not uh, going to get that tip anywhere else but here people. exactly break who else is going to tell jail. you to break into jail <laughs> um once the storm really starts hitting and the it gets cold to the point where all the flood waters freeze and the people could traverse on it they claim that there was 15 feet of snow coming so everything was covered in 15 feet of snow mm. um so I mean that's that's a shit ton of snow. That's not just you got to dig yourself out. That's depending on what type of building you're in. That is your building now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to think your average two story house is probably close to fifteen feet. Hey, one of the uh, that makes one of the strengths weaknesses that we cover for us in this everything becomes a bunker. Yeah, everything is an underground bunker. Every you now, if you, let's say you have a nice, cozy little ranch. Yeah, you know what I mean with the basement. Uh-huh. Get your little, you know, your doilies up and everything, and you got a few supplies in the basement. You just got an underground bunker. How tits is that? That's yeah. You have a tits bunker. Compliments of Mother Nature. Yes, I mean, think we you get your lazy. You don't have to move anything either. No. Your lazy boys in there. Your TV. Hopefully, your refrigerator, yeah, hopefully you don't need you refrigeration. Uh, wood burning stove, though, or something, because it's going to be fuck cold wood, down in your bunker. Wood burning stove, um, generator, but depending on how much fuel you have. Yeah. What's well, the same as a wood burning stove or any type of fireplace? How much fuel, in this case, wood, do you have? Right. That's where, in this situation, there's a lot of apocalypse, obviously, that we're going to cover where you can have a generator and you can run it. A little here, a little there, just to either run your well pump to get water, uh, maybe to cool off certain things, get a little heat, cold, whichever it may be. This is the one where you would have to run the generator constantly, so fuel would be a huge issue. If it, yeah, if it's your source of heat. Yeah, this isn't something where you can kick the Jenny on for an hour, turn it off, and be okay. No, this has to be constant. So, and you're right, the other fuel would be wood, which is one of the things I have is this is one apocalypse where living in the city is going to suck balls. Not that living in the city would be all that great anyway, in my opinion, but living in the city is going to suck. This is one where you're going to want to live a little bit more rural. You got plenty of trees around to cut down, uh, just for lots of different reasons. I think in the country is better for this one. I agree, and I think the biggest problem with being in the city, all joking aside, is people. Yeah. And because you got to think your major cities, millions upon millions of people who re- rely upon, like we've discussed, I'm sure you can think of a steady supply of trucks or trains or whatever type of you know mass, uh, the way to mass move items to and from other locations. They need to bring in food, water, supply, everything. Everything gets trucked in. I mean, you may have, maybe you have a little garden, maybe you have a rooftop garden. Mm -hmm. I've heard of those things, but everything gets trucked in. You're not growing your own food. You're not making your own food. You don't have any animals. You're you're reliant upon this this system. Yes. Most people in the city are 100% reliant on outside source for everything that they need in life. 
he, there's maybe a very small percentage of people that even get a small percentage of stuff that they supply for themselves, like you said, a rooftop garden. Not many people have those, and it doesn't supply that much. So, yeah, if you're a city person, you are relying on the outside world. And most people live in apartments in cities. We mm-hmm. can agree upon that. Mm-hmm. Some people might have houses, depending on the city. Like uh, Chicago does have a lot of houses in the city. But, you know, a lot of people live in apartments because, you know, big buildings. Um, so you, you're talking about how much, how much food can you stock in an apartment? Even yeah. if, I mean, seriously, uh, maybe these people stocked a lot of stuff. Who knows? Um, even if you're a prepper in the city. You know, um, I'm sure if you listen to this, you know what a prepper is. If you don't, it's someone who is preparing for cataclysms like this. If you don't know what a prepper is, you have stumbled upon the wrong podcast. <laughs> or maybe you stumbled across the right podcast. Or maybe, yeah, and we'll hold you your go. hand you in an entertaining way. <laughs> Sorry. Well, okay, maybe I shouldn't use the word the entertaining. Negative, not the positive. You're maybe right. Maybe I shouldn't maybe. use the word entertaining because, you well, know, we entertain ourselves. That's yeah, all that matters. Exactly. That's um, Our fan saying. out there may disagree. Our one fan. Our one fan <laughs> may say, one. no, you entertain me. <laughs> But anyway, you know, but someone who, who even if you stock for, you know, X amount of food, X amount of water, X amount of whatever, you're in an apartment. How much space? You're, you're limited. I mean, and you have a lot of people around. And I'm not saying people are necessarily bad, but once people get hungry, people take. Oh, yeah. They may kill. They yeah. may, you know. And when we get down to the weapons section, I, that's, that's, I have something about that. I mean... There is a potential, I guess we bring it up here, I suppose, in food of cannibalism. In the city? In the city. I could see that for sure. Instead of people eating ballpark Franks, they're eating Franks balls <laughs> and park. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure somebody out there named Park. Uh, yeah, somebody be. named Park. I don't know. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, the peop- some people, I mean, look at that, because uh, we like to discuss movies. You remember the movie Alive about the soccer team oh. that crashes in the Himalayans? That's a good one. What are they? They resorted to eating people. Yeah. I'm not here to tell you to do it, but obviously you don't want to be the one eating. So think yeah. of it that way. Yeah. So, I mean. Get ahead of it. <laughs> get ahead of it. Be the eater. <laughs> yes. Be an eater. Although and, they, they were eating the dead only. So, but hey, in a world this crazy, who knows? Well, I'm, I'm not saying they're going to eat somebody alive, but they may. We're fucking starving. Mm-hmm. You know, Brian over there is a fucking raging dick. What if we kill him and eat him? Yeah, I nobody's going to miss him. Nobody's going to miss him. He's a fucking tool. He's, yeah. you know, with nothing. And who knows? Maybe you kill him and you eat him. You're so you're so hungry. Yeah. You know, maybe you just draw straws and figure out who, who you're going to kill to eat. I, that sounds crazy, but I, I guarantee know. you may not do that. And you may say, I will never do that. I will die first. And that's fine. But there's people out there who are willing to eat other people to survive, and you don't want to be dinner. That's all I'm saying. Yep. You know, I want to be a lot of things. Dinner was is not on the list. So even if you're not going to be the cannibal, at least be able to defend yourself from becoming the meal of a cannibal. Yes, Yeah. exactly. You don't want to end up there. Um, in the movie, a pack of wolves escapes from the zoo. And then they go run around trying to eat people because they're hungry. Understandable. You could even use that as a example, parable, whatever you want to call it, dogs. I mean, if there's reports of stray dogs like that used to belong to people not getting fed, making these feral packs. And those are even worse than wolves, they say, because they're not afraid of people. They've been around people, so they understand what people are. Where sometimes with wolves and bears and animals... They're not quite sure about people. They make mm. it hungry enough they might try something, but they're, whereas do- you think about domesticated dogs that are now feral, feral pack of dogs. And they'll walk right up to a human. Exactly, because they know what it is. They're not afraid of it. They've mm-hmm. been socialized, so to speak, around it. Interesting. So, I mean, you might, ha- not, I don't know about in a city. I don't know what, what type of dogs. You probably don't have the big shepherds and those type of dogs that worry about in the city, but mm. I mean, a fucking pack of wild Pomeranians coming at you. And I mean, that is horrifying. Your actually. ankles are fucked. That is, actually, that is actually horrifying. A pack of Pomeranians. Think of your ankles. <laughs> Those little ankle biters are going to chew you up. Yeah, and the, and he, one of the reasons that's horrifying. What a slow, shitty death. Yes. Getting eaten by Pomeranians. Yes. At least a shepherd or a Malinois. Hey, he jumps You're in here. should throw it out, You're maybe. Yeah, You're dead. It's short. It's fast. It's though. over. These guys will be Pomeranians nipping at you. It take two days to eat you. That's miserable. It is. 
But I mean, there's a possibility of that. Um, you don't have to worry about cats attacking you. Fucking just grab it and twist its head off. Yeah, I mean, it bites you. Just cats are the first thing to go. And since we're on the topic of dogs, cats, whatever, and obviously apocalypse, uh, just one thing that always that I always try to. Again, another one of our tips that I try to give out: keep your dogs. People have a good, medium to large sized dog. Keep your dogs. And everybody's talking about, oh man, when it comes, I'm gonna have to kill my animals and eat them. Do not eat your dogs. It'll, do not eat your dog. Eat your cats. Eat your cats. cats. Are great, make a great meal, and they're worthless. But a dog is good for so many different things. They're a good alert system. Yep. They're good for protection, especially if you have a good loyal breed. And another big thing is. They, they want the same thing you do. They want food. So when you're, if you're on the move and you're out there, uh, in you know, in the world, they're looking for food as well, and probably the same types of food that you're looking for. And guess what? They smell thousands and thousands of times better than we do. So they're going to detect the food way before we do. Just like they're going to detect enemies and danger way before we do. Keep your dogs. And, oh, they, uh, and yeah. they don't eat anything really comparatively. I, you just feed them a little what you can, and you can keep them alive. Keep your dogs. Exactly. And I guess if you are if you're gonna shelter in, um, try to stock up on some dog food. Yeah. I mean, you, people food seventy two hour supply. Obviously, you want more, but if you could at least stock up on, you know, get a couple bags of dog food, maybe even if it's the cheap, you know. Super box store, Old yeah. Roy or Old whatever, Roy. Old Roy, whatever it is. And listen, would you, you know, no, you don't want to feed him that, but he'll eat it. If he's hungry, he'll fucking eat it. Oh, yeah. You know, hell, you might eat it if you're that hungry. Oh, you will. But at the point is, at least, you know, if you're, if you're preparing and you have a dog and you plan on keeping the dog, which is the best thing to do, maybe set aside a little bit of something for him. A couple cans, maybe, of dog food. Definitely. Uh, That's something. A, that way you're not dipping into your, uh, food rations and you know he's happy yeah yeah because again like you said dogs smell really well and alert system if nothing else maybe they can help find food they sniff out an animal that you could then if you have the if you have the means via firearm or whatever that you could take an animal out right and then you know flush out your quarry and then you can actually shoot it and kill it shoot it and kill it and then obviously there's you can share he can have the if you don't want you just want the meat you don't like the gross parts he'll eat them he don't give a shit Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, but at that point, you're probably going to, nothing's going to seem gross. You're going to no. want to eat everything. No, you're if it's be that bad. eating eyeballs like they're hors d'oeves. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You're, you're going to be loving that shit. Tip to tail. For so, sure. I mean, this one is just, I guess, for strengths is, is it's Mother Nature, like you, you were saying earlier. Oh, yeah. There we go. Strengths. It's, well, that's where, yeah, we're kind of in the categories. It's, it's Mother Nature. It's, yeah. It's, she, she a bitch. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's nothing you do. You can't. You can't fight her. No, it's okay. So we touched on to, to tie things together. We touched on the military in the last episode and uh, the obvious might of the American military and how it's just, I mean, holy shit! How do you fight the American military? This trumps the American military tenfold. Military is nothing compared to Mother Nature. So I, if you want to talk about strengths, yeah, forget about it. I mean, nothing you can do. Well. <sighs> The military is made of people, mm. and even though there's hundreds of thousands or whatever, in in theory, you could technically kill them all. I mean, it would take a great force, a great weapon, blah, 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 blah. but technically you could fight them and you could kill them. Mother Nature, you, you can't kill it. Yeah, there's nothing There's to nothing kill. you can... You can you can do your best to resist it, shelter, whatever, but you can't, you can't fight it. You can't... Right. There's no quote-unquote weapon to fight this enemy being Mother Nature. You, you, you're fucked. I mean, just... Yeah. You, you're fucked. Pretty much any other enemy, you can attempt to mount an offense at some point. Yes. Fighting Mother Nature, it's all defense, period. Mm-hmm. That's all there is. It's all That's defense. a good way to put it. It's, yeah. it's, it's all defensive. Yeah, there is no <laughs> offensive against Mother Nature. There's no offense. It's all defense. I like that. That's, 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 that's exactly what you're doing. So weaknesses, there's, there's none. There, yeah, exactly. I mean, really, because we go strength and weakness, there's, there's no weakness other than, I guess, if you can get the right type of shelter. You can ride it out, but it's not a, again, it's defensive. Not a technical weakness. Yeah. It's just a... Yeah, a defensive uh, 
triumph for yourself, but it's not a weakness per se. The only weakness we can hope is, since it is a woman, maybe she'll get distracted and move on to something else. Yeah. Or maybe but probably not. Crash her car while she's talking on the cell phone. Yeah, or or, yeah, yeah, something. Something. You know. Or Facebook will Facebook take should, her attention away. And, and she'll stop. She'll be scrolling and, yeah. And we'll, but that's it. That's it. Um, she'll, she, maybe that's what happened. Maybe that's why she stopped at Florida. Yeah. Something came up. Something came so up. The case, she was going for the equator, but and then she got sidetracked. So I mean, and she, you know, she went off and did something else. Thank you. That's see. That's why we love women. I mean, good and the bad. Yeah. She, she could have took it all, There's but she good. she stopped to Florida. That's right. Yeah, she, you know, because she loves old people. I guess. Probably. Yeah. You know, they do like old people. Yeah. All She's right. Sensitive like that. Um. Yeah, that's all I really you got. Anything in that, or you want to like not hair? to strengths and weaknesses? Yeah, I mean, it's just like there's not even really it is what it to is. Say about it. It's yeah, it's yeah. you fucked. It's what it is. You gotta you gotta defensively write it out. Um, I guess your survival basics: air, water, food, shelter. Uh, air, about the only thing that's still good, except for it's cold as fuck. It's cold as fuck. Um, but it's not contaminated. Right. I mean, there's nothing that. I mean, I guess technically, if Mother Nature caused a fire, you know, but you're, it's not it's not a virus. It's not right. like if something were to throw a whole bunch of dust and pollutants in the air, like maybe an asteroid strike. As long as it's not too cold, you can breathe it. You know what I mean? It's it's, it's fine. if you, As long as you're not, you know, standing in the middle of a chemical factory that happens to explode with, with a right. hurricane or a lightning strike, you're good. You don't need anything, maybe some face covering, whatever. Um, water for there was a lot of water, but if it's the seawater, it's going to be salinated. Now, maybe it's not as bad as usual because it's combined with all this fresh water, but it's not going to be readily drinkable. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the rest of the water turned to ice, the rest of the water turned to ice. And then if you, at one point when it first started to flood, the sewers were backing up. So that water is now, Ooh. yeah, infected That's with right. sewer water. That's right. So your water is either polluted, frozen, or too salinated to drink. So water is an issue. Water's water is an issue. Even though you're on your planet, there's nothing that's that's uh, no real outside sources contaminating it, like a Trixie virus uh, or anything like that. It's still, it's going to be either polluted or frozen. I mean, you're going to have to have, again, bottled water. You're going to have to have a stash. Yes. I mean, in this case, you're, if you're boiling it, you are gonna you could boil off contaminants. I guess if you had the right tools, you could potentially chip out chunks of ice and then melt it and boil it Good to call. kill everything. Good call. Um, I think if you were in a city and you were surviving and there's the potential for the sewage, I would kind of go back to last one i would chip it out if you could boil it and then use another form of filtration like a life straw or i know there's there's ways you can look them up but set up some type of yes or even just something simple where um you could even do with a coffee can like an old metal coffee can like some people do like you know a layer of charcoal you have to have the materials with sand charcoal gravel so when you pour the water through the container you know i mean i would do all of it because you don't, again, you don't want the potential of getting a virus. Even if it doesn't kill you, I mean, you don't want to be puking and shit in your way. Yeah. You're, not, dehydra- you're going to dehydrate yourself. Right. You make it even worse. Not a good situation to be sick in any way when you're already battling this, you know, this massive uh, situation with Mother Nature. You don't want to be sick on top of it. Which brings up something, and it's kind of a. I don't juvenile, but when the when the Prince of Persia and his group are in the library, and they're in that room with the fireplace burning books for heat, um, and maybe they didn't show, it, but they never like established sanitary rules, aka where do they take a dump? Yeah, like it was so cold that at one point they didn't want to leave that room, and I guess we don't know the time frame, and they weren't eating as much, so they're not going to have as much waste. But uh, do they just go dump in the corner? Yeah, and, and let it freeze. Bo- you're burning all your paper. Yeah. Yeah. 
definitely something to consider. I mean, at least have a bucket or something. Yeah. If you're sheltering in, have have a you know some yeah. type of shitting situation. I know it sounds it's, it, it juvenile sounds weird, to think you, of. And you you know you bring it up and it's it's no it's very real. You have to think if about that, eat, especially in a bunker type situation, or you're just hold in, uh, hold up, lock down somewhere. Yeah, you got to do it. I mean, everybody, we have to consider the fact that there's you know still natural uh, mechanisms that take place, and you have to account for them. If you eat, so, you yeah. shit. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's just how it is. It's yeah. the circle of life. If you're too frozen that you don't have to shit, well, you don't have to worry about it anymore because you've got bigger problems. You're dead. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that was you know kind of I guess talking to the movie is. The, the there was that big group in the library, and then the majority of them, we'll say eighty some percent or more, decided that they saw people leaving on the you know walking out on the ice because they could walk on it because all the the river the flooding had frozen. They were going to escape and get south, and then Prince Persia told him not to because his he talked to his dad, you know Dennis Quaid, and. Uh, he told him not to because the superstorm was coming and they were going to freeze, shelter in, and they all left and they ended up dying because they didn't have supplies. Or and this is going to miscellaneous later, but they didn't have any, anything like supplies to take with them as far as just to survive in the extreme cold. And they didn't shelter in and they all died. Yeah. So that I guess what that brings up is we don't all have Dennis Quaid as a dad, and we don't all have a group of writers telling us to shelter in or leave. So I'm not picking a side and saying who was right and who was wrong, but if this was a situation and you live in the north and this type of situation came and you've got word that to the south is still viable, that still do you leave or do you stay? If you're low on resources, hmm. you know, um, do you to write it out or do you try to go? And then it all depends on who you have in your group. Do you have infirmed? Do you have elderly? Mm-hmm. What means of transportation do you have? Do you walk? Do you have people that can walk? You know what I mean? Can you make it that far? Yeah, that's a tough one. And in this this particular one, the people who did decide to leave, they didn't have any idea what was coming. So they just thought, hey, this is our chance. It's now or never. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's try to get as far south as we can. Which uh, makes sense because it's Prince of Persia is the only one that had the – benefit of that kind of scientific knowledge coming from the all-knowing Dennis Quaid. And he did try to tell them, but they didn't listen to him. Right. So, But I, you remove him from that room full of people. If you remove uh, Gyllenhaal from all those people in that room. Everyone they're, goes. They're, everyone goes. Everyone goes. Because there's no voice of reason whatsoever. There's no scientific knowledge otherwise. And they're all like, yeah, you're right. This is our chance. Let's go. So, yeah, in that situation, hell, I might even be like, yeah, let's make a break yes. for it. Because I don't know there's a massive fuck ice hurricane coming over the horizon. I didn't read ahead in the script. I don't want to ruin it. Yeah, if I don't know that, then I'm going to go. And uh, so, I don't know. But having any of that knowledge, let's just say that the Weather Channel was still up and running. Yes. Okay. And you're like, okay, bad situation, flooding, it's all frozen now. We're starting to get a bunch of snow. But the Weather Channel says this is it it's all clear uh there's not going to be any infrastructure in place for some time if you can move now and get south to where it's warmer go or the weather channel says uh you think it's bad now look what's coming stay where you're at then you can but otherwise you don't know you have to you you really have that's that's a decision you have to make at the time it is go that is a taking away uh dequade giving the information to the Prince of Persia, that's a gut call. Yeah, totally do, is. Do we ride it out and hope for the best by scavenging here, we'll say, or do we try to make a break south? And that, I guess, also depends on what do you have. Like, they're in the city and the waters are so high, There's all the vehicles were flooded. So they didn't have a car they could load in and drive part of the way or a snowmobile or even... Hell, a sled to pull shit with. It's all your gear in a sled and pull it. I mean, they had nothing. It was all on foot. It was all you could take with you. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, it, without the information, it's it's a coin flip. Yeah. 
Yeah. But that's still, you have to, all the things you just talked about, you have to look at those factors and just the, uh, how plausible it is you're going to make it. I mean, let, let's just say they want to make it to North Carolina, not even that far, North Carolina, just a couple states away from New York, right? Right. I think my geography it's is right. in that area. Okay. <laughs> it's over there. So a couple states south, it's still hundreds of miles. Can you walk hundreds of miles in a perfectly normal situation, like sunny and 70? I can't. What's uh, I mean, sure, over several days I probably could, but I mean, not several days, several weeks, probably months. But is it, anyway, is it the Appalachian Trail? The Appalachian Trail that goes or the Pacific. Yeah, the people will take. They, they'll, yeah. they'll think about it. These are hikers or or people that are in, or have decided I've got six months. I want to say. Yeah, they take months to do months it. months to hike from. It's, it's like a bucket list thing, yeah. you know. And maybe people, you know, our fan has done it, and you know all about it. <laughs> And you've hiked it, or you know people who've hiked it, or you've you've researched it, and you know a lot of these people, they'll bring one, a backpack and it's a one change of clothes so they can change out and wash and blah blah, or a couple pairs of underwear, whatever. But the point is, is that it takes months, months mm-hmm. for some of these people who are experienced hikers, right, to hike from one part of the country to the other. So now you got extreme weather, no or low supplies. And you're trying to do the exact same thing. Yeah. So what we're getting at here is we're probably pushing a little bit more to the side of uh, hunkering down and taking away the whole coin toss aspect of this. For me, that's what we're getting at anyway. This is starting to illustrate to me that maybe travel is not the, 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 the best situation here. If you had to do it the way they did, on foot, yeah. walking. Yeah. If you could somehow, you had a four-by-four four vehicle... And you could load everybody up, and you had enough gas, say a tank of gas, full tank of gas, and you have a full tank of gas, and it can get you, let's say, 300 miles, because a big 4x4 SUV. And you've got a couple spare cans of gas. Again, this is all planning ahead, best case scenario. And you know that just driving, if everything works out, you can make it you know, a couple states south real close, maybe. Maybe because mm-hmm. you can load supplies, you don't have to put it on your back. You load up the back, you drive south, you get to a point where maybe you run out of gas. Maybe you get lucky enough, you've come across a vehicle, you can siphon some gas out. Maybe, but you, you have to assume what you have is what you got. And you head south to a point where it's even 20 degrees warmer because you're farther south, and then you start hoofing it. Maybe, maybe. maybe. Right. Which goes back to. I, I, I said it earlier about this is one where I would not want to be in the city. This is one where, God bless the heartland in the Midwest, because if you're in one of those areas, the flyover states, yeah, yeah, the flyover yeah. states. If you're in one of uh, if you're in God's country like that, you probably got a four wheel drive. You probably have an ATV. You probably have a snowmobile. Uh, and then you, you jump on one of those things, and you have transportation. You have a way to get out. Your Prius is probably not your best <laughs> option yeah. in this case. Well, the only the only downside to being there is if 15 feet of snow covers everything, and you've got that 4x4 four four locked in a garage <laughs> waiting if you don't move quickly enough, you fucked. Yeah, I mean, you know yeah, what I mean? You I mean, got to start. That's why at the point when they all leave the the first location was, where were they at in that first location? Was that the library as well? That was the library as well. Oh, so they, yeah, never, they never okay. left the library. So when all when the large group of people leave the library, that would be at, that would be the point that you would have to start heading south in your SUV, ATV, whatever it is, because after that, the snow got too deep to be able to do anything. I guess in this one, in this one, the coastlines are bad. Yeah, they're bad. the most dangerous because you're flooding, and okay, the coastlines and potentially Great Lakes. If you're close to the Great Lakes, yeah. um, maybe the Mississippi. No, no, not the Mississippi. It won't flood enough to. I mean, it'll flood some yes. houses. But I mean, we're talking because you, yeah, think it was enough water that the vehicles were covered and that a ship. That Russian ship drifted into the city. Yeah. Which could, if the currents were right, the sure. water was high enough, yeah, it could happen. I mean, it was obviously 
creative writing to provide a vehicle, not a vehicle to escape, but obviously the food and the medical supplies were on board, which would be. And But anyway, point is that could happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, it more likely would have come in and just smashed into a fucking building and toppled over and it would have been fucking awesome looking, but, you know, not helpful for them. Not at all. But, but so the coastlines are bad. Coast and maybe near major. I'm trying to think. Coast and the Great Lakes. Do you think anywhere else would probably be bad? That'd be about it. Everywhere anywhere else. We have massive bodies of water, and that's about it for America. Yes. And even the Great Lakes, if, you know, you're far enough south. But you're, they're even, they're going to flood, but not like the oceans. I don't think it's going to be the point where you can't, you can't get out unless you're t- right up on the, the lakes. You might, I don't know. Anyway, the point is, if you're near big bodies of water and they're flooding, that's an issue. But other than that, it's all going to get cold because they did drive for a while. I, I don't know where they were at, where, where D-Quaid was at when him and his two buddies went driving. But they were driving on the roads either. for a while until they hit a semi-truck and they had to walk from there. The semi-truck that was disabled in the road or whatever, abandoned. Right. So, I mean, you can drive some, but again... You got to do it for that 15 feet of snow because once that happens, unless you've got some way of getting on top of it, you've got some, you know, I guess if you had some four story house and you want to throw a garage on top and a bunker underneath, hey man, you're the Whatever. best. Be you're prepared. fucking prepared you for are, everything. Yeah, we, then you do not need to listen to this podcast at all because you're next level. Unless you're just listening to the, these idiots. What do they know? I've already got it all. Yeah. I've already got it all. Yeah, we we are fun to listen to just to know, just to hear how much we don't know. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. So, that's that's bad. Um, Let's see. Food, I guess, technically. Because we were talking water, yeah, but we good. got off on a yeah, tangent. Food. food. It'll become scarce. Yeah. And they did show at one point um, people raiding grocery stores, taking water, food, whatever. You Again, you go to... Katrina, you go to, uh, I don't know if the LA riots would qualify, but you go to these these disruption type situations where supplies get scarce, uh, snowstorms, blizzards up north, and those shelves will go bare quickly. And there's no trucks and no way to get anything in. And so if you're not supplied... Or, you know, hot, whatever you have for supplies, that's... Or if you, I guess you can make a mad dash to the store and buy a whole bunch of shit, but you're not going to get everything you need. Mm-mm. And if you're living in the city, again... Yeah, the city's bad. But this, And this is one where even if you're not... Food is one where even if you're not in the city, you, you have to have it on hand because you're not going to be growing anything at that point. No. A garden is going to be out unless you have a greenhouse. It's still well. And I don't even know if that's going to be well after the fifteen feet of snow. That don't mean shit. But I guess before that, if this and it depends on where you live. If the super storms are windy, that can knock that shit over. Yeah, that too. I mean, because you have to think. Uh, I know somebody has a greenhouse when it got really windy. Just a bad storm, like fifty mile an hour winds, blew some panels out, and they mm-hmm. had to go out there and fi- fix them. Not a huge deal. It wasn't like a lot. You know, oh my god. But just think of that. That's a basic type of situation a bad just a bad storm a regular bad storm not these super storms so um you are gonna have to probably loot and scavenge um i know that sounds cool i mean let's be honest when you see an apocalypse movie you see them out to loot and scavenging and you're like yeah and you're and it it seems it's it's like a i guess a cool part of the movie because they're looting and scavenging like what are they gonna find oh they gotta get food but you, you i mean you're not the only one out there doing it. Right. This is the reality of scavenging is way less glamorous than what they show in the TV shows and the movies. Yes. I mean, it's it's a, it, <laughs> that's a hard go. That's a hard way to live. You're right. You're competing with a lot of other people, um, which, I mean, if we just, whatever, natural progression, that would take us into weapons. I will say, and for I'll this, say this for the looting and scavenging is at the end of the movie, when the helicopters come and pick up the Prince of Persia and his dad, D. Quaid, there's other people on the rooftops in the city of New York that they're going to, I guess, get rescued because they're going to send more military vehicle, helicopters, whatever, which is fine. But here's my thing. I'm just throwing it out there. That ship sat there for how long before they went over there to look for medical supplies because the Prince of Persia's girlfriend got an infection mm-hmm. and they needed antibiotics? You're telling yeah. me in that entire time, two days, three days, a week, we'll say even, 
Nobody else that was in those buildings, there was nobody else in those buildings that said, fuck that ship. Let's go yeah. see what's on this ship. Hell yeah. The fact it was, and granted, you know, we're not trying to, we are, we are critiquing the movie, but nobody else, that thing, as soon as everything froze and the people were walking, yeah, you should shelter in place, but the first thing they should have done is when there's nobody else around, because you don't want to go see, because once you get, someone gets the idea, they see you going up there, they're going to get the idea, but if you can look and there's nobody around, you better sneak your fucking ass over there and clean it out. All the supplies, all, and, and you, you better loot and fucking scavenge that son of a bitch quick, because if you don't, it's not going to be there. Yeah, well, yeah. And that it's, right there, that's, you just explained how it's going to be for anything. You better be the first to loot and scavenge. Mm-hmm. Because it's not going to be there. There was that exodus, but we're at the end. There, there's You're not going to be the only person that's going to shelter for whatever reason. You have the information because you're your daddy, uh, D. Quaid. But everyone else, there's some people like, it's not worth traveling mm-hmm. because of X, Y, Z. We're going to ride this out. Whether, you know, whichever decision was right or wrong. In this movie, the sheltering was right. But it obviously in a real situation, that could be wrong. But everyone, you're either going to leave or you're going to shelter. And I guarantee the... Eight, ten people, I don't remember, I didn't even count, that were in the library are not the only eight or ten people in a city of millions right. that have decided, I'm going to ride this out. They're, the, the government's going to come save me or people are going to come save me. And no, they did or didn't, and not really. You need to rely on yourself, obviously. That's why you listen to this, or you just have nothing better to do. Um, but that shit's going to be gone because they're going to be, uh, we got a can of you know, cream of chicken soup and a box of macaroni. Let's go look around and see what's left. And maybe they they're gonna you're gonna break into the other apartments in there. Oh, that's gonna be probably your first thing. Yeah, yeah you're gonna break into the apartments, you're gonna see what's there, you're gonna and maybe maybe people are gonna get together and share resources and sing kumbaya. But Highly I don't think unlikely. So. No. So again, weapons. We'll, we'll get into weapons. And that yeah, that's where they, in this apocalypse, your weapons, that's where they're gonna be good because we already covered it. There is no offense against Mother Nature, so your weapons are only good against the other people out there. Yes. Protecting your shit, what you have from them, and, well, let's be honest, going and taking stuff from others, or even if you're not of the type to go and take from other actual people, still, just to show a force, if you're, let, let's just say you are out looting and you come across a nice cash, like a nice grocery store that hasn't been hit yet, and it's you. And your group, and then another group, and you have guns, and they don't. Well, guess who gets the good stuff in the grocery store that day? You do. So, or if someone's just trying to take your stuff, like you, you were kind of alluding to, you're not gonna. You know what? I'm not gonna go kill these people for their supplies. I can't live with myself morally, and that's that's a decision you need to make. Every every person needs to make. Obviously, not just you. I can do it. I can't do it. You you don't think that other people aren't willing to kill you for your supplies? Oh, so absolutely. if you don't have weapons to protect yourself. Uh, you fucked. Yeah, you know, what I mean? unless you've got some again, unless you and we'll get to shelter. We have how to hundred percent hit shelter unless you got some bunker that's just fucking tits. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That you can just ride it out. They can shoot and bang away at the door all day. You better have some weapons. Yeah. So again, against the actual threat, there's nothing you can do. But against the aftermath, we'll call it mm-hmm. of the people. That's when you're going to want That's some weapons. You need weapons. And for that category of people who think to themselves, oh, I can't do that. I can't live with myself. I can't kill or threaten for food and supplies. I'm just not like that. Well, I'll tell you this much. A prolonged apocalypse, people are going to change. You might be one of those people who think, I can't do that. But when you're starving, I mean, how many people out there listening to this anyway, have actually ever been in person. a state of starvation. Person. How many person living listening to this? Person. That's right. Ever, person. I keep forgetting we only have one family. Yeah. How many person <laughs> yes. has, has has have you, you, the one you, fan that's you, actually listening guy, to this. You guy. Do Bob. you I bet his name's Bob. I hope it is. Bob. Hope it is. He's Bob. Bob. Uh yeah. Have you ever actually been in a state of starvation and know what that feels like and what you are willing to do when you are in a real state of starvation? Your kids are starving. Right. Your wife. Exactly. Well, maybe not the wife, but the kids are starving. That's that's the other thing. Now you're adding those factors. I, this is just if it's just you or a state of, of thirst, dying of thirst. Yes. Have you ever been in a state where you have literally gone three days without a drop of water 
and know what that feels like and what you'll do to get water when or, you've gone or you, that long. You're gonna it. watch your your loved ones just yeah, suffer. That would be fuck the worst that. Thing. I'm I'm going down there and I'm getting that shit. I don't care exactly. who I got to kill, whatever. And so that's what you're gonna be. And maybe again, maybe you are like us and you're trying to plan ahead and you're trying to set things aside and you've got water and food and stuff for your family and you've got enough that you can stretch out to three months, six months. If people know that, mm-hmm. or if people are just coming around checking, if they're hungry or they're thirsty, they're going to fucking take it from you. And so that's where the weapons are going to come in. their children and desperation will do crazy things to a normal person. I mean, you, you might think you know your neighbors, but when they're desperate and their kids are dying of thirst and hunger, they're going to do desperate things. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And they'll remember that time that your dog shit on the lawn and they'll be happy to kill you. If you're in a rural <laughs> setting, you know, a little suburb. <laughs> but, uh, all right, I'm going to pose this for you. Not that we're looking or waiting for No, that. but <laughs> the Johnsons, you know what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, what four things would you bring with you in this apocalypse? I want to kind of start that trend. Four, or do you want to go five? I want to go four. I want to go four. Okay. That's what I want to do. I want to go four. All right. Four things. We're not talking food. We're not talking water. In the in the realm of weapons or tools, what four things? Weapon or tools. Weapon or tools. What four things are you going to bring? Always have to have a knife. Yep. Good survival Period. knife. I, I'm on board with that. Always have to have a good survival do, knife. Again, dual purpose because you can use it for combat if you absolutely had to but then you can also use it to you know cut things slice things whatever so good tool yeah yeah many many more than dual it's so many purposes for just a good sort of a good knife a good sturdy hard use knife um i'm assuming a straight blade not like a folder i prefer fixed blade but yeah fixed there's, blade. there's fixed some, blade there are some really there's good, good but ideally you know there, but you don't need to fold it you're in the apocalypse you got a, f- a fixed blade but anyway okay yeah exactly you know it's not like you need to hide it in your pocket at that point um gotta have an offensive firearm and a defensive firearm so just i mean i have to pick something universal in both categories and i i, I tell you what i'll do i'll do one or the other, so I'm not stealing into your thunder. I'll do uh, a defensive. A defensive weapon is a pistol. Yep. Pistols are defensive weapons. Uh, so for a pistol, got to go common ammunition, common magazines. Uh, man, put me on the spot. What I would prefer. Let's go through. Yeah, do that. Is okay. What I'd prefer is an HK 45 tactical. Good choice as far as gun. Yeah, it's reliable. Uh, it adds ultimately reliable. Um, you have a threaded barrel if you want to put a can on it, if you want to put a suppressor on That's it. That's true. To, if there's a situation where you need to be a little bit more quiet and discreet to not attract attention to yourself, which in an Apocalypse situation. If you're us, you don't want to. You want to attract as little attention as possible, so that you have that option. True. Uh, you have 45, which is very common ammo. True. Not the most common, but it's up there. It's in the it's, top three. Yes, it's, it's in that. Ammos. It's in that three ammo debate. Right. You're correct. Yeah, it's in the top three most common ammunitions out there. So you have that. Um, it's got a rail for a light, so you can mount a light. I mean, it's just a very utilitarian weapon. I mean, it can do so many different things. It has lots of different... It, it fills pretty much all of the roles that a pistol needs to fill. It can do anything. The only downside... Oh, and it's a high capacity for a forty five. True. So, you know, 12 rounds plus one for a forty five. That's awesome. The biggest downfall with the HK, obviously, is the availability of magazines. I was going to say, you and the 14 other people yeah, out in the world exactly who have an HK-45. Exactly. <laughs> the, the magazines and parts, if you were to manage to break an HK. If you can break an HK, wow. I, I don't know what but, you're doing right, with it. But, but it's an apocalypse. Let's just you never say, know. Right. Let's just say you break something, the availability of You've parts. You've got a better well. chance of stumbling upon a group of 20 females who want nothing more than to love you <laughs> yeah. till the end of time than you do wives. and be your 20 <laughs> wives and not argue and be okay with whatever orgies you have than right. you would right. with finding H&K magazines and parts. Yeah. You know, true. it's very true. So I, mean, I just, I'm telling you what I would want because I love my H&K. Yeah. yeah just say that. That's so, what you want. 
But yeah, I mean, and and let's let's be honest. I'd be uh, an automatic weapon. The one thing that can make it completely useless is no magazines. Yes. If you don't have a magazine for your weapon, it's broken. It's a single shot. Yeah. yeah I mean, best, you can pull the slide back, shot. drop, drop around, in, and take a shot. And so, slide back. so, if yes. anyone out there practices pistol craft, we'll call it that, and you pull your gun and you go to the range, and which is all great. If you have a firearm, you should practice with it. And you go and you practice, bang, 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 and then dump in the mag and go for a fresh one. I'm not saying that's bad depending on the situation, but you, you know, can you always guarantee to get that mag back? Exactly. That completely changes. I'm not saying to change the way you train, but that's something to think about. Are you I, just dumping that mag button, grabbing a spare, slapping it in, racking the slide, or whatever? There's different ways to do it. And then bang, bang, bang. Did you just dispose of that magazine? Yeah. And you brought up a great um, point in a conversation that I had with another like-minded friend years ago. I brought that up. And uh, it was, <laughs> unfortunately, I think it was the HK we were talking about. No, it wasn't. This was a rifle that he had, and it was a it was a unique rifle that he loved. And I can't remember what it was, but it was it was a type of magazine that you don't uh, you don't. Oh, I know what it was. It was a stayer. Oh, it was an AUG. Yeah. Okay. Now you can find those type of weapons that'll take an AR magazine. Back then, you had to have a stayer magazine. You know, I take my stayer. What happens when you run out of magazines and your gun's no good? Why would I run out of magazines? I go, do you train to retain empty magazines? And a guy, you well, maybe I do. Okay, let's just say that you do. Let's say you do train to retain empty magazines in a when you run out, which most people don't. Right. But now add the factor of you're in a gunfight. You're under you're 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 in danger. You have you had got rounds coming down range at you. Are you going to stop and go, oh shit, that magazine. Let me grab that real quick. Let me keep my head down and grab that magazine and then run. No, no. You're gonna over time in an apocalypse. You're going to lose magazines. So, what we're getting at is, it's best to have a gun that has magazines that are easy, real, easily replaceable. Um, I, God, I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but a Glock. I would the choose are everywhere. I would choose a Glock 22, the full size 40, and if I cheated just a little bit. Just a little, and I'm cheating, so you can call me on it. I would, you could buy like Wolf has them, Lone Wolf. You could buy a nine millimeter barrel to drop into that thing, and the readily of the ready availability of nine millimeter and forty ammo and magazines for a Glock. You could yeah. almost run that thing until there's no more ammo and mags out. Yeah, almost. And I know it's kind of shifting, but a lot of police departments. Still have Glocks. Now, again, I know that there's kind of a shift in that. You know what I mean? But a lot of police farmers still have Glocks. Yeah. Yeah, they do. So, um, and then. Yeah, Glocks are, I, I, hate, I hate to say I have a Glock for the way to go. The other one I would have to say is pretty common is a 1911. 1911. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of those. There's a lot of those. I think another tool I'd bring is a Tomahawk. I'm kind of a Tomahawk fan. Because it's, really? a, it's a good offensive weapon, but it's also a good you know, it's an axe. You can chop. You can do things with. <laughs> Maybe I watch a little too much Last of the Mohicans. You can, you know. But I, I'm a, I'm a kind of a tomahawk guy. <laughs> so I'll probably always carry a tomahawk with me. A good knife, a good tomahawk, a good pistol. I'm a Glock guy. You can make fun of me. And I think, and this is going to be slightly controversial, I would carry a 308 type rifle. I would carry like an H and K variant, American made PTR 91. That's what I would carry. And I understand that not as common as your AR, AK, but with 20-round mag with the right scope, it's a good offensive weapon against looters and bad people and a good hunting Mm -hmm. because you've got more range and accuracy. And if shit goes bad like that, you're talking about game is going to be harder to come by and you have to take longer shots. Let's say there's some deer and other animals survive and then you're out walking around and you see a deer several hundred yards off. You get a better shot off with that than you will a 223 in an AR platform or an AK platform. Dang, yeah, and it is still combat right. effective. Yeah, you're right. Uh that just and I can't. How can I argue that when I'm sitting here saying I want to take an HK45? Right, right. I can't really argue that you're taking this. This not not rare necessarily, but 
not the most common rifle Correct. out not, there. Not the most common. So I, I can't disagree with you on that. I would probably go with the AR platform just because I'm very familiar, very comfortable with it. I have a mild range scope on it. Um, it, it won't re- even though I have a little bit of a scope on mine, it won't reach out as far as the 308. But yeah, it's I'd, that's not a bad choice. I mean, you get you know with a decent barrel, 18, 20 inch. Well, 18 is the standard, but 20 inch barrel yeah. with a good scope on it. Military you magazines, can, parts. Yeah, uh, that's 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 the big thing with the yeah, AR. Yeah, modularity, availability of ammunition availability of magazines, availability of spare parts. I mean, all of those things. You are going to see ARs laying around everywhere. If there's dead military guys around, you're going to see M4s laying next to them. If there's, you know, abandoned cop cars or unfortunately abandoned, you know, dead cops here and there in the in the worst that you're going to, there's going to be an AR with If they have a patrol somewhere. rifle, it's going to be an yeah, AR. A patrol rifle. So, uh Obviously, we don't like to talk about dead soldiers or dead cops, but, you know, we are talking about the end of the world, and they are still human, so there are going to be some of them here and there. Point being, very common. Yes. It's very common. It's going to be around. Um, I guess real quick, we'll kind of touch on shelter. We'll just throw it out there because um, a generator would be good. Shitter is what I wrote down. But, you know, if you're, if you're underneath that 15 foot of snow, it's bad. I just mm-hmm. put, ideally, maybe someplace higher up in, like, in Arizona or Nevada would be ideal because you're – out of the bad stuff, so you're not going to get buried, but you're close enough to the equator in Mexico that if you had a decent shelter there, you could probably ride most of this out for, if you had enough supplies for six months to a year, if you had enough, and then see the, how things are. Yeah. That'd be ideal. And if you're a Floridian. Fuck you. Uh, you. you yeah. I'm and kidding. You just you just missed the ice cap. So you're if you're a, what at the end of this, if you're a Floridian, you just became a Canadian. Yes. Geographically. Yes. You just became a Canadian. And all Canada's fucked, basically. <laughs> They're gone. You think it was bad for America? Canada's gone. Yeah. They're probably under 80 feet of snow. Exactly. I mean, they're under 15 feet of snow on a regular basis. I know. Up in, like, Saskatchewan yeah. and shit, wherever. Those You're talking places. 30, vagina. 60 feet of, yeah, vagina, vagina, whatever. Vagina is super cold. Um, For miscellaneous, uh, obviously, first day, like, the girl got cut. She had a septic wound, antibiotics, if you can have yeah. it. Stock your antibiotics. Physical fitness, unfortunately, come back to that one again because they did have to do a lot of walking. If you're going to move, a lot of walking and, and hiking, it's still not bad even the people that sheltered in because you're going to have to – you're still going to have to do physical. They had to go to the boat mm-hmm. to get the supplies. And it just comes down to the more fit you are, the longer you're going to survive, period. Even if you're holed up, the more fit you are, the longer you're going to survive. Arctic weather gear. If you could get some surplus military cold weather gear, mm-hmm. that would be something. And it's not cheap. If you look into it, it's not the cheapest thing. But if you can get some good military or even, you know, type stuff or even a good Arctic hunting set and slowly start setting things aside, if you're worried about a cold, that would be good. Obviously, that's money. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're specifically looking at a cold weather one, if you had, obviously, because. You know, when they went looking, when Dennis Quay went looking for his son, the Prince of Persia, um, they had all that Arctic gear, which kept them warm. Yeah. So that if you had it, that'd be great. Yeah. But he's a, yeah, he's a, he goes on, ex, he yes. already had this stuff because this guy goes on expeditions. I mean, he's like, yeah. So he yeah. already had this stuff laying around, which, I mean, comes to the point that let's just say you're a northerner in America. Let's say you live in one of the northern states. You probably already have Arctic gear. And if you don't have, like really legit Arctic gear, you should probably get it because, okay, now granted, we're talking about this apocalypse in particular, but let's just say any apocalypse happens where it shuts down the infrastructure in the system, you, you're going to have to survive your winters with no heat. Yes. Or at least little heat. Maybe burning wood and stuff like that, but not the kind, you ain't going to have a furnace. Even if you, yeah, yeah even you're going to have to, you're going to need, you're going to have to go out hunting, you're going to have to go out foraging, maybe scavenging, that depending too. on your area. That too. And maybe you have enough wood, or you're, or you're just going to go out to chop wood. Yeah. I mean, you have a stove or, or, or some type of wood heating system. You, you know, yeah, you have maybe like a, a thick jacket, a pair of pants. You might want to upgrade it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or have it big enough you can put lots of layers underneath. That you, but you can still function because you still got to cut that wood. You still got to do all that work. I mean, yeah. Um, and then the thing, the last thing I'm going to bring up and kind of uh, is 
when I say everyday carry, I'm not talking. I'm I'm kind of talking about like when the Prince of Persia goes to New York. They don't. They're not in their bunker. They don't. They're not in their shelter. What do you carry with you on a daily basis? And I mean daily basis that you have with you. Do you have a lighter? Do you have a flashlight? Are you talking about right now or right in, now in this apocalypse? Right. Now I'm I'm challenging our fan. Challenging, are you challenging me or you? What do you carry with you? you? I mean, you're looking at me, dude. I walk around in a pair of boxers all the time. Oh, that's okay. It. Well, that's what this I was, I was wondering. Yeah, this isn't just because we're in the bunker. This is oh, how I am. All okay, the time. I didn't know. You might not have known. Yeah, no, right. I go out in the world like this. Oh, I didn't know. So I'm pretty unprepared. That's well. Yeah, I mean, you know, just something to think about. What do you? What do you <laughs> take? And, and you could say everyday carry if you're able to carry a firearm, and you're that type of person who carries a pistol with you everywhere absolutely that's always a good thing but what do you do you carry a folding knife do you carry a a lighter do you carry a a flashlight do you carry i'm not saying you have to have like rifles and magazines and everything i mean i guess you could strap a rifle to your back and a backpack full of supplies depending on what state you're in sure (laughs) yeah i mean a swiss army knife you know, I, you're just a basic screwdriver, knife, you know, nah, tool. Those are good to have. I, I have just a basic pocket knife at all times, a flashlight, as you saw, at all times. And then I don't, yeah, I don't leave my house without a pistol, ever, ever, right. ever, ever, ever. Um, sometimes I have a pistol in the house, which, yeah. Uh, no lighter, though. That is a good one. It's always good. Just keep just as one of just those, a, one of those little big like the mini Bix. Just mini to have Bix a source or just of fire. The, you buy a cheap four pack of lighters. It's like two bucks now at yeah. the store, and throw one in your pocket. Yeah. You never you never use it. It'll stay. It doesn't leak. It doesn't. Yeah. You know, it's not like a, a Zippo's look cool, but if you don't keep putting the the lighter fluid in there, no. So just a regular cheap plastic gas station lighter. Yeah. Exactly. Buy one for a buck. Throw it in your pocket. It'll last for years. You can, and then you don't have to worry about if you want to do the flint method or, or you want to you know that, rub two sticks like you see in these survival shows. And I'm not knocking those skills, but if you've got lighter, guess what? You're laughing don't, at the next guy. Don't throw away technology. Don't throw away people doing things for so many years that they built lighters and you could buy a four-pack and throw it someplace and put one in your pocket and you got spares. Yeah. And this isn't a technology that that uh, goes bad with the end of the world. This this is a technology that's always good. So use it. Yeah. Use it. Yeah. This isn't something like, oh man, we have this technology, but we got hit with an EMP and now it doesn't work. No, it's a freaking lighter. Matches and, fl- and lighters. Yeah. They'll work forever. Yeah. Until they either run out of fuel or they're exhausted. You yeah. know what I mean? Like the, you exhaust all your matches. So that's something to. It's small. Throw it in your, your pants pocket. You're not even talking like. You're not right. weighing yourself down any. You just changed me. I'll, I'll start throwing a lighter in my pocket. I do, I do believe in having the source of fire. I just don't do it. I carry a little, a little, just a cheap gas station lighter with me everywhere. Yeah. So I have one in the car. I just, it's, it's if, a good idea to throw it in If your you're pocket, in, though. and there's another thing, um, maybe we'll, we'll do this next one, but if you, if you drive everywhere, like a lot of people do, you don't take public transportation, what do you keep in your car? Mm-hmm. What do you keep for supplies in your car? If you break down, there's an apocalypse. If something happens and you're driving and all of a sudden you have to ban your vehicle in 30 seconds to a minute. Yep. And what do you have to grab to take? Do you have a bag? You know, like some people call them bug out bags, get home bag, whatever you want to call it. What do you have to grab with you to and help go. you survive, to either get home because of a natural disaster or in this case, climate change to get <clears throat> excuse me, to get from where you're at to where you need to be. Yeah. What do or, you, you know, or maybe you're just in a, sec, a very secluded area and you get a flat tire and you got to walk for a while. Yeah. And, I mean, you might as well throw your supplies on your back. If you got it, have a go bag. Yes. Have a go bag. Ideally have a go bag. Ready to go. If you live in the city and you take public transportation, I mean, and let's say you take a backpack because it's got your supplies in it for work, a laptop maybe and paperwork or whatever you do for a job, a living. I'm sure there's a little pocket somewhere you could throw a few things in. Yeah. You know, maybe a flashlight. You know, flashlights are always good. Uh, You know, maybe another source of fire starting. Um, Mm -hmm. Throw a bottle of water. Bottle, a couple bottles of water. Yeah. Not, you know, not a candy bar because of chocolate milk, but like a pack of nuts, some jerky, something that'll last basically forever. Yeah. Just throw a few things in there, so at least you're not. If all of a sudden, boom, you're left stranded, you've got something. 
something to help you through that situation or to get to some place to get more supplies. Right. That a go bag is a very temporary emergency situation, but it's have it, have it set aside and prepared. I mean, one of my favorite sayings of all time: chance favors the prepared. Yeah, absolutely. You don't know what kind of chance you're going to come across, so be prepared. Absolutely. Um, I guess uh, we're going to start this, uh, and we'll end on this. One out of ten stars. We're going to start rating how oh, that's believable right. on a scale of one to ten. Or I guess not stars, just one out of ten. How how believable we think this is going to happen? How likely? How likely? That's how, how likely is this apocalypse? In other words, how much do you, our one fan, prepare need to, for this. need to really think about preparing for this particular one? How likely? Shit! Again, I'm not a scientist. Uh, and, and when I, I say this, this, when I don't say climate change is in a hundred or thousand year thing where it comes slow, I'm talking about a sudden. Yeah, over a couple weeks, boom, right? Shit just got real. I think it's definitely to be considered for yes. sure. Uh, stars or just numbers, one ratings. 10, one what 10. do you want to call it? We'll do rating one through ten. I really, I would probably the factors that you have to prepare for this. I'd probably put it at a four because they apply to other things, so it's not bad to prepare for them. But the likelihood of this particular apocalypse, I think, is. Relatively low of it happening over a two-week period. I gave it a... I, I would probably say four, too. I mean, yeah. it's not bad to have some of these supplies on hand. Most of the supplies you get for this, you could use it in the other type of apocalypse. Right. But the chance of this all of a sudden, super, super storm, whatever, with a negative 150 degrees sweeping in and freezing everything, four is being generous. But I'll yeah. give it a four because you never know with the cosmos and the sun and sure. shit could happen and the before. Fact, the fact that I'm not a climatologist I'm or whatever not you call a, them. Yeah, I'm not any of that. So yeah, I'll so. give it a four. Sure, I'm good with so. four. All right, so that's what we're going to kind of start doing is rating them at the end so that you know how how we think you should prepare for it. Yeah. So a four. How so, uh, I'm, yeah, I think we covered it. Uh, so... I don't know. Go forth, people. All right. So I'm, I'm Drew. <laughs> I'm Frank. And enjoy the apocalypse.